Last week, we spoke about humor. I really worked hard at trying to get you to laugh. I got more laughter out of you right now than I did yet last week. It was, I, I had friends that said, so how was service? And I said, well, I felt like I got heckled without anything thrown at me. I was trying to get some emotion going, and I don't know whether you guys were sleeping, or I really, really was just flat, or you had a dare for yourself. Okay, today the service is on humor. I'm not going to smile. You can't make me. I won't do it. But that's how it felt. And I thought, oh, wow. And by nature, I'm a clowny person. And I've always been known by making people laugh, even if it was just by being silly and ridiculous. And so when I got nothing, I thought, hmm. You liked it? Oh, God, thank good. I didn't give her any money to say that either. So you know, thank you, Sparky, really. I, I, it was just so much. And I thought, you know, I left out of here. And I thought, I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to do humor again when I got nothing. So I thought, I'm going to pray on this a little while because that's typically what I do when I draw a blank. And I loved that you said singing is a form of prayer. Laughter is a form of prayer because it is. It is so, so true. And I'm glad that you practice your spiritual practice of singing and laughter because it makes us feel filled up with joy. So I don't care if you laugh today. It's all right. You hold it in. Doesn't matter to me. But remember one thing, it is good for your health. Toby said that. Last week I spoke about how it actually releases endorphins in your body, so it's good for your heart. It's good for your emotional well-being. So if you don't want to smile or laugh, I don't care. I'm good with that. <laughs> so good with that. Did anybody spend any time from last week thinking about things that made you laugh or gave you joy? <laughs> and I want to I give you major props, Jacqueline. I really want to get... Because, you know, for those of us that are clowny and we're always with the one-liners all the time because it's somewhere in, ingrained in us. We're not really trying to be. We're just being ourselves. It is often taxing for those that live with us. <laughs> They're just like... Get over yourself. <laughs> and, and this is why we were saying that laughter is, a, is an opportunity for prayer. Yes? Because when people are doing things that they think are funny and you're not thinking it's funny, prayer is the only thing you can, can do <laughs> without doing the kabong on them to get them to be quiet. Um, I'm going to just say this briefly because I have to. We're looking at things that are laughter and funny and opportunities for joy. And then prayer was brought up. We have a lot going on in our nation right now. And I know that a spiritual place is not where we bring up politics. And we're also not, you know, normally bringing up other people's religious viewpoints. But when I look at how much negativity and hate's going on right now, I'm going to ask you all, rather than getting on this snarky bandwagon with everyone else about what's going on, politic temperature, as well as certain states choosing to do certain things that are a little less than loving and kind and taking us back about 70 years in time, that you take it as a moment of prayer, prayer that this will not be the truth, prayer that this is not the truth. Because if we feed into that negativity and that hostility, we're just helping the situation. And I know it's really easy to want to just go in there and for those of us that are Facebook fans, start snarking away. But the truth is, that's not going to create anything that's positive and it's not going to solve that problem. So prayers that it's all squashed as far as any forms of negativity and any forms of berating or not being okay with other people that are different than you. I've been watching on the minister's listserv a huge amount of stuff that's coming up around ministers saying, for instance, our next convention next year is supposed to be in Nashville. And right now there's a slight boycott starting. I'm watching the wave. Good chance that the annual conference won't be in Nashville because right now with what's going on in the state of Tennessee. In our spiritual practice, we don't believe in breeding hate or excluding people. 
And so if Net Tennessee wants to do that, then they're pretty much, we're, we're looking at possibly pulling the convention and putting it somewhere else. So I'm happy to see that at least that's a way of saying, you know what, no, we're not going to support your bad behavior with, with bringing our group of fun-loving, positive, upbeat people to you for the chance that you might exclude some of us, which will then not be okay. So now I've done my few-minute bit on politics. Keep that in mind. So my talk today is, does God have a sense of humor? No? You don't think so? He made Ted. And he made me, bless his heart, you know? Okay. I think God has a sense of humor. And I actually looked the platypus up and the anteater this week because I, I was thinking, well, penguins are cute, but platypuses are just strange, just strange. And, and then anteaters are strange looking, and it's like, okay. So that shows you that God has a sense of humor. Also, we, each one of us, have our own sense of humor, right? Regardless of how we vibe and what's funny to us, we have our own sense of humor. And since we are all interconnected, and all part of that divine spirit I choose to call God, God must have a sense of humor. He, she created us. So I'm looking at humor in a different way, though. Because God, spirit, universal source, energy, whatever you're comfortable with using, has created us with the ability to do anything we want to do, including accept our good. Emma Curtis Hopkins, who was a teacher of Ernest Holmes, said, it's your good, and you ought to have it. And what she's saying is, it's your divine birthright to accept your good. It's your job to claim it. And so many of us, maybe not you, I often get dug in. I have an idea in my mind. I think it's a brilliant <laughs> idea. And I'm certain it's the only idea. And so I go about it, doing a thing with this idea. And the idea is not working. Rather than being open to another idea, I either get frustrated and give up, get frustrated, stomp off, or wind up not reaching my potential of something that was good that I wanted to have. Now, Think about this for yourself. Pick a situation for yourself where there might have been a time where you had this thought and you were running with it and it wasn't working. And then something else out of left field, completely different than you would have wrapped your head around, appears and winds up making the thing you were trying to implement not only fabulous, but so much more grand than you could have imagined. You have two choices. Rejoice in the fact that Spirit, God, chose to know you so well that knew something greater than what you were being able to think about and just put it out there for you. And you could be grateful about that, or you could be snarky about the fact that it wasn't your idea. It was your idea. You were just not willing to be open to seeing the idea. So I look at these things as God having a sense of humor. You know, you're fighting, you're, and you're struggling, and you're trying to make something happen, and like a five-year-old comes over and does the thing for you in two seconds, and you're just standing there like, what? I now take these moments where I want to say, really? Are you kidding me, really? And say, God has a sense of humor. Got me out of... Uh, my own bloated nothingness, you know, got me out of my way has to be the only way. And I'm always looking at situations in my life where I am not opened to another perspective or point of view. This doesn't happen for any of you. I'm certain of that. <laughs> uh, right? And that's why I'm telling you. So it's a perfect example to not let it happen for you. And I'll... I'll just be upset. It's not working, it's not working. And then I get to drop into prayer and say, I'm open to receiving my good. I'm open to receiving something far greater than I can imagine. Because I know you got a plan bigger than I can figure out. 
So let me get out of my way, and you bring it on. So that way I get something even grander. And I want to tell you a little story. I love to tell stories. We love to tell stories, yeah. It makes us laugh. And most of the time, I figure if I can crack myself up, that's okay. Um, this isn't a funny story. It's one of those, again, oh my God, God has a sense of humor stories. I have this behavior. It's not me. It is a behavior that every three years, I get an itch to get a new car. Nothing is wrong with the car. I just want a new car. And it's not like a luxury car, and it's not a sports car or a fancy car, but it's, I want a new car. And oftentimes, with the finances, I'm upside down in my leasing or my, my loan, and so I'm bundling it up onto the next car. So it's clearly not serving my highest good to keep getting new cars. But I had to start asking, what's that about with you that you need to constantly have a new car? I don't know too many women who have a car thing. It's usually more of a guy thing. But, but I, I had this. And so it was, um, it was a couple of years ago, and it was around the beginning, beginning of fall. I started looking around at cars. And I thought, ah, oh, here we go again with the cars. And I'm trying to think of what car I want. Now, as I've gotten older, the criteria shifted. First of all, it has to have some lumbar support because I've got to have back support. Okay? It, it has to look nice, it has to run well, but it, it has to have lumbar support for my back. And it still has to look cool. You know, there's challenges here, because not all of them have lumbar support. And it has to have a sunroof and blah, 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 blah. So I've got all this in this car already. And I'm driving one day. I decided that instead of the bag lunch, which I usually do, because I'm a picky eater, I was going to go half a mile away from work to Subway. I was going to get a salad. I'm driving. I am just got the blinker on to pull into Subway's um, driveway. Car comes and smashes my back end, spins me in a circle, and I'm just sitting there, full-on whiplashy, just sitting there. Put the car in park and shook, just shook, and said, are you kidding I'm a half a mile from work, okay? My mind is thinking, did the guy stop or did he drive off? And then the other things kick into my mind. I'm going to have to pay a deductible to get this car fixed, yada, yada, yada. Guy comes running over to me, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just came from the hospital. My daughter died today. Okay, as a minister, I now move out of the place called, are you kidding about my car? And I'm thinking, how can I be with this man? You know, he's just lost his child, and he shouldn't be driving because he's a wreck. And I'm busy asking him, how, how, can, I, how can I help you? How, what can I do for you? And we're doing the exchange of the insurances, and he goes, everything's covered, everything's covered, I'm so sorry. And, and I'm saying to him, what, what can I do for you? I'm going to go home. I sat in the parking lot shaking, but also dropped into prayer for this man because I'm thinking, the heck with my car. You know, somebody didn't just die in my family. I get my salad, and I'm sitting in my car shaking, and I look at the back end, which is trashed out, and I'm thinking, wonderful. Okay, got to now deal with this whole thing because i got to have another car because it's smashed into my back tire, and it's not really drivable. Okay, good news, I get to rent a car. Good news, I don't have a deductible. Good news, everything is great. It's during the holiday season. Three weeks go by, I've got to rent a car. All right, you really appreciate the car you thought you didn't want when you drive what we call a hoopty in California. I don't know what they call it here, but it's a funky, rundown little automobile that at least the car it, people doing my car let me use. I get the car back, everything's great and grand. Look at my pretty shiny new bumper. My car's really looking nice. Maybe I'll let go of the idea of a new car. Hmm. Springtime, another incident. And I gotta let you know, of all the years I've been driving, maybe one speeding ticket. Okay, that's a lot of years of driving. So I'm a pretty conscious, respectful, mindful driver. I'm driving down a little street in the community I live in, 
and it's two lanes on each side and side parking. I see this guy starting to back out. I got the little dog in the car on the front seat. He's starting to back out. I've got the blinker on trying to get out of his way because I'm laying on the horn and he is not hearing me. Maybe he has his music up too loud and he's laughing, but he does not see me and he smashes into the front end of my car. My dog goes flying off the seat and hits the, the floorboard and is like, Arr! and I'm like, now I'm really upset because you've smashed the front end of my car and you've hurt my dog. Okay, I get out and I say to the guy, did you not see me or hear me? No. I said, apparently not. And he looked at me and he's, we're doing the exchange and I'm asking him questions. He goes, you know what, I have a lunch appointment. I don't have time for this. I said, well, I don't have time for having you smash the front end of my car either. Thanks so much. And he, like, drives off. And I'm just sitting there thinking, okay, two accidents in less than a six-month time. Front back end is now fixed. Now we're getting the front end fixed. I was thinking about a new car. Yes? I had a new car. Front end, back end, everything ran well. Be careful about what you're thinking about. And I thought to myself, all right, Spirit, I don't know what's going on with this whole thing, but can we be over this now? And I sat with it a little and I thought, well, maybe part of it is I needed to get over this whole compulsive issue around cars and replacing them constantly and be happy with the comfortable, well-running, safe car I have. All right. Year goes by, I'm now headed to New Jersey. You know, I moved to New Jersey. I've got a 24-foot U-Haul and a car tow, because of course, with all this work, we have to tow the car along. I have had a car since I'm 16. In California, from where I hail, you don't get around well without a car, unless you're in a metropolitan city. You, you have to have a car, because you usually commute somewhere. Most of us commute to work. So. In my mind, letting go of the car wasn't even a concept. Okay? Now in New Jersey, two cars, because Ann has a car, two cars. My car is now not being driven. The new car that she has is smaller and easier to park. My car's sitting in the driveway. Once a week, we turn it on, drive it around the block to keep the engine okay. And after two months of making car payment on a car I'm not driving, I'm thinking, this doesn't make sense. And then I reflected on all I went through with this ridiculous car, including driving it across country, and now I'm thinking, I'm going to sell the car. But the beautiful thing is, it sold in one day on Craigslist because the car was in pristine condition. So I just look at things and I say to myself, God has a sense of humor. What divine spirit would do to get me to see how some of my behavior is super ridiculous is really very funny. So no, it's not a ha 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 funny thing. It's an ironic thing. It's how many things do we do in our life that we get attached to, we get dug into. It has to be this way or this way or this way. And in fact, it's not for our well-being. It's not for our highest good. We're just attached to our own little way of how things are supposed to look. So this is partly why laugh therapy to me is crucial. The more I'm able to laugh at myself, at my ridiculous behavior sometimes, the more I can make light and the more I can stop myself from getting rigid about things. Spirit, God wants us to have the best. Wants us to have the best. And we get in our own way of having it. We do. We wish for something and we pray for something and it has to look exactly like this. What if it was better? What if you got a gift and it didn't have shiny paper on it, but the gift was fabulous? Wouldn't you be excited? Maybe some of you would just prefer to have the box with pretty paper. I don't know. Sometimes that's <laughs> nice. But I just said to myself, okay, these are all little things where God is showing me, God has a sense of humor by my unwillingness to be in the flow, by my unwillingness to be flexible and accept my own good. That's not the truth. That's not what I want to have happen. So 
I'm going to share one little thing with you that was passed on to me from my mom. My mother moved to Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and spent 10 years there. She's a life coach, and she was working with the Sarsi Tribe 7. Chief Roy Whitney was the person she worked with with the elders. And he had shared this story with her, which she reminded me of. Spirit wants us to have everything. And spirit gets so frustrated that we are on our path to goodness and greatness, doing our thing, and we're excited, and we're right up on it, and we listen to someone else's point of view. Or we listen to someone else's judgment. And all of a sudden, we're deflated, and we don't proceed to the thing that's given us the most joy because we're more concerned about the person's feedback that they want to give us. Maybe never happened to you at all. Has happened to me. And afterwards, I think, well, what was that about, that I would allow somebody else to, you know, squelch my own good here? But Spirit wants us to have everything. And I believe that if we, many of us don't believe that God is up in the sky looking down at us, because we believe that God is all around us, in and through absolutely everything about us. But if God, in whatever gender preference you prefer, was sitting there watching us, I'm certain that it would be huge laughter. Oh my God, look at that. I I gave them this thing, they walked right past it. I gave them that thing, they're whining, they don't have the thing, it's right in front of them. I'm certain God would be falling out laughing, saying, man, oh man, look at that. And they keep whining about what they want to have, and I'm giving it to them, and they're not seeing it, because the wrapping looks different. That's why I say sometimes forfeit the wrapping, just have the gift, don't worry about it. So... Creator, which in Native American culture, creator is God. Creator gathers, it's in the forest, gathers all the animals. All the animals. And says, I've got this great thing I want to give to man. But it's so amazing, but I want to hide it. And the eagle says, creator. Give it to me and I'll take it to the highest of highs. No one will ever be able to find it. Owl says, no, no, creator, give it to me. I have this nice wingspan. I'll tuck it in my wing. They'll not find it there. Mole says, father, great father, give it to me and I'll go and bury it as deep as I possibly can in the ground and they'll never, never find it. The creator thought about it for a moment thanked every one of the animals for their support and their ideas and said, nope, I have a great idea. I'll hide the gift within man. He'll never think to look there. (laughs) Right? Right? It is inside of us. It is inside of us. Who we are, the gifts that we are, the joy that we are, that we share, we often hide inside of us. Because it's a little scary sometimes. It's a little vulnerable sometimes to share it. So we keep our magical gifts and talents to ourself. Well, first of all, that's selfish. And second of all, it is also our joy and our good pleasure to give out the gifts that we have to share with others as they share their gifts with us. It's part of the giving and receiving thing. I give you and share with you my gifts and talents. You give and share with me your gifts and talents. And we call that communication. We call that community. And I'm sure you've heard the expression a long time ago, no man is an island, or it takes a village to raise a child. Well, it takes a village to keep a community going in consciousness in general. And that's why we all gather together. So that if one of us is having a bad day and kind of sliding off the cliff a little bit, somebody else is there to lovingly offer a hand, offer a kind word. We take classes and things in order to keep our minds open, receptive, and growing. And we then build friendship with people that have like mind, Life, like mind, meaning a positive way of viewing things, a happy way of being. And so this is why I wanted to just talk about God having a sense of humor. Then 
Think about how many times that you snark yourself and wonder, if Divine Spirit could be watching you right now, would they be falling out laughing saying, see, I gave them the opportunity to continuously choose goodness and joy and they still want to put themselves down. No, you don't. No, you don't. So that's where I'm at with God having a sense of humor. If God has a sense of humor, so do each and every one of you. And I want you to find ways to laugh because it's good for you. And it's part of your spiritual practice. Let's take a moment just to go inward and be still. And imagine yourself at the funeral at the front row laughing. Because I'm willing to bet you the person that just passed away would be much more happy to know that you were thinking of things about them that you could laugh about versus crying. So knowing we are all connected, we are all part of that one, that one divine magnificent presence that I choose to call creator. I'm knowing for you and for me because we're all connected, that we're opening up to our own greatness and that every day we're looking for ways to practice our practice of laughter and goodwill and good humor and joy. To practice our practice of silliness just because we can. <laughs> to know that we'll have far more laugh lines on our face than frown lines at the end of our, our journey. I'm knowing for each and every one of you that you allow the humorous part of you to show up more and more often so that you can experience silliness and joy and play. So that you might be more buoyant, have more levity in your life. And I'm giving great thanks for each of you being willing to ask yourself, what makes me happy today? What makes me want to laugh? What makes me want to be creative? Because the more we laugh, the more we are in that space, the more the creative energy within us opens up and expands and expands and allows us to do our good work in our purpose for life and make our contribution in a joyful way. Giving great thanks again that you are all open to not having it look your way. Spirit's got ways that are greater and grander for you and if you feel stuck that you ask, show me a way that's different than my way and that I'm open to receiving it with great, great appreciation. So today on this great day, I know that as we've spoken words collectively, we've spoken words separately, we're knowing in consciousness, just as we've spoken this, that there's already a shift in consciousness. There's already a demonstration revealing itself to you in such a way that all you can do is say, God has such a great sense of humor. Life is so good. I release this to the action of law knowing it's done. And if any of this resonates with you, would you please respond by saying, and so it is. And so it is. Mm -hmm.